Welcome to the Deep Dive. We're the place that takes that huge pile of sources you send us and finds the really fascinating stuff inside, turning information overload into those aha moments. Today, uh, we're diving into a character everyone knows, been around since, what, 1938? And he's getting a whole new look soon with James Gunn's Superman film. Uh, that's out July 11th, 2025. You've given us this great stack of articles, notes, all about Superman's powers, how they supposedly work, how they've changed over the years, and maybe the big question, are any of them even remotely possible? So our mission today is to unpack the science, the fiction, and just the fascinating evolution of the Man of Steel's crazy abilities. Yeah, it's a fantastic topic. It really lets us you know, build a bridge between pure fantasy storytelling and actual grounded physics principles. And what's really interesting here is how the explanations for his powers have shifted. They kept trying to make them sound scientific, kind of, even when it totally stretches reality. We're going to look at those attempts and see what, if anything, actually holds up. Okay, so let's jump right in. One of the oldest ideas, and you still hear it sometimes, is about his strength. That it came from the gravity difference, right? Krypton being this huge planet with massive gravity, Earth much weaker. So the idea was less gravity here means poof, he can bend steel bars, lift buildings, you know, billions of tons. But from a science perspective, does that actually work at all? Uh, no. Not really. That's a critical point. Planetary scientists, people like Paul Byrne, they pretty much agree this explanation is, well, pure fiction. Here's the thing. You would weigh less on a lower gravity planet, yeah. like on the moon, right? You weigh about one sixth what you do on Earth, feels lighter, but your mass, the actual stuff you're made of stays exactly the same. So yeah, on the moon, you could jump way higher. Lifting mm -hmm. things would feel easier because there's less pull downwards, but your actual strength, your muscle power, that doesn't increase one bit. And the strength of steel, that doesn't change based on gravity either. So fundamentally, just changing the gravity, it wouldn't give him that kind of monumental strength. Right. So no quick trips to Mars to become super strong then. Shame. In fact, scientists like Richard Muller point out it's kind of the opposite. To even survive on another planet long term, your body would need to adapt, maybe even get stronger just to cope. Our bodies are really tuned for Earth's 1G. Look at astronauts. They need hours of exercise every day in space just to stop their muscles and bones from, well, wasting away. Exactly. And that's a key insight. It suggests that even for an alien like Superman, being in a drastically different gravity field for a long time might actually be bad for him, biologically speaking. Our systems, muscle, bone, they're adapted. It's not a power source. It's more like a necessary environmental condition. Huh. That really flips the script. Okay, so maybe natural strength from gravity is out. But what about tech? You mentioned Michael Reckner, a bioengineering professor. He notes humans can already lift crazy amounts in emergencies, like six, seven times their body weight. So could we maybe build superhuman strength here on Earth? How close are we to that? Well, technology is definitely closer than biology on this one. Experts uh, like Philip Ray and Robert Gaunt, they suggest that things like robotic limbs, exoskeletons, yeah. dot combined with brain-computer interfaces, BCIs, that holds real potential for boosting human strength. And we're seeing early versions. Tommaso Lenzi mentions exoskeletons for military use that can increase strength maybe up to 10 times. But the big hurdles now are, well, they're heavy, and they use a ton of power. Gotcha. So we have the pieces, kind of the motors, batteries, chips, but putting it all together into something sleek and functional that works with the human body, that's the real challenge. Mm -hmm. Sounds like Iron Man might be more plausible than a gravity-powered Superman, maybe. No way, yeah. Okay, so if gravity doesn't work, let's turn to the explanation the comics eventually landed on, and the one most people know now, our yellow sun. Originally, it was just, he's an alien pretty vague. But by the Silver Age, around 1961, they established it. His powers come from absorbing and metabolizing energy from Earth's yellow sun, which is different from Krypton's red sun, Rao. Right. And this was a really crucial pivot in his whole mythology. It's kind of like photosynthesis, but on a completely different scale. His body, with this supposedly unique, dense molecular structure, acts like a living solar battery. It stores this immense solar energy, and that energy then fuels everything, his strength, his speed, his invulnerability. It provided a sort of uh, unifying logic, even if it's fictional logic. But like any battery, it has limits, right? Which is good for storytelling. If he pushes himself too hard, uses too much power without recharging. You can run out of juice, basically. Become weak, vulnerable. Yeah. And the flip side is the red sun being exposed to radiation, like Krypton's sun, blocks his ability to absorb yellow sun energy. 
so it depowers him. He can also um, consciously overcharge himself for short bursts. Or in the newer comics, there's the super flare where he just expels all his stored energy at once, mm -hmm. leaves him totally powerless for about a day while he recharges. Okay, so we have the solar engine. How does that translate into the classic powers? Let's break a few down. Uh, super strength, speed, and stamina, those seem like direct results of having all that energy, right? Absolutely. That stored solar energy is the raw fuel. And his dense molecular structure is apparently what lets him use that force without, you know, ripping himself apart. And it's not just brute force. The energy boosts his reflexes, speeds up his perception of time. So his actual limits on speed and strength often depend entirely on how much solar energy he has stored up at that moment, often described as incalculable. So the sun's the power, his body's the amazing machine. Okay, what about invulnerability? How does the solar energy explain that? Well, the idea is the solar energy doesn't just power him, it fundamentally strengthens his cells, his molecular bonds, makes his whole body incredibly resilient. So he's immune to you know, bullets, explosions, most conventional stuff. Yeah. But that brings in the bioelectric aura concept again. Ah, yes, the aura. It's like the comic book explanation multi-tool. Yeah. It helps explain invulnerability, but also how he can protect others. It extends around him like a shield. That's how Lois Lane doesn't get vaporized when he flies her around. Some versions even say this aura let him survive things like a supernova. Wow. Okay, that aura is doing a lot of work then. It explains how he can carry a plane without it breaking apart too, right? We'll get to that with flight. But first, the really visual ones. Heat vision. That seems like the most direct use of solar power. Pretty much, yeah. It's him releasing stored solar energy as focus beams from his eyes. And the control is amazing. It can be pinpoint accurate, like for surgery, or wide beams for mass destruction. And sometimes, it's even shown as invisible, so he can use it subtly as Clark Kent. Sneaky. Then there's a whole suite of supervision, X-ray, telescopic, microscopic, and seeing the whole electromagnetic spectrum. How do they explain X-ray vision working? Still blocked by lead, usually. Usually, yeah, leads the classic block. The explanation often involves, again, manipulating his bioelectric field, or aura, to perceive certain types of cosmic radiation passing through objects. The other types are more straightforward extensions, seeing incredibly far, incredibly small, or seeing wavelengths humans can't, like infrared or ultraviolet. He basically perceives way more of the universe than we do. And super hearing. Hearing distress calls across the planet. Yeah, the range is often depicted as planetary or even beyond. He can tune into specific frequencies, specific sounds from huge distances. In the DCEU movies, remember his death scream, it was heard globally. That gives you a sense of the scale they sometimes portray. Okay, now the one that always felt a bit weird, super breath or freeze breath. How does blowing air make things freeze? Huh. Yeah, it seems odd, but this one actually has a neat little connection to real physics. It's based on something called the Joule-Thompson effect. Joule-Thompson? Yeah. Basically, when you take a compressed gas and let it expand very rapidly through a small opening, like Superman pursing his lips and blowing hard, the gas cools down significantly. Oh, like how a CO2 cartridge gets freezing cold when you use it? Exactly like that. So Superman forcefully exhaling this compressed air at high velocity creates that intense cold, the freeze breath, or just the force creates hurricane winds. It's actually kind of clever. Oh, okay. I'll I mean. give him that one. And finally, the big one, flight. Yeah. And this idea of tactile telekinesis, flight wasn't always flight, was it? No. Originally, it was just able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, basically super jumping. True flight came later. And the explanation evolved too. Post-crisis and a lot of modern takes like the movies, it's tied to that bioelectric aura again. He manipulates gravity or electromagnetic fields around himself. This tactile telekinesis is also the go-to explanation for how he lifts massive objects like that jetliner from a single point without it just collapsing under its own weight. The Ura distributes the force across the whole object. Man of Steel showed him learning this, remember, levitating little pebbles and stuff before he really took off. It became less about muscle and more about conscious energy manipulation. Right, making it almost a mental power in a way. Speaking of which, what about his actual mental abilities and his healing factor? Sun power, too. In many versions, yes. The yellow sun was said to enhance his brain, too. Genius-level intellect, perfect memory, eidetic memory, instantly understanding any language. Early on, he had some weirder stuff like telepathy, hypnosis, even super ventriloquism. Those mostly got dropped later, thankfully. But yeah, reading a whole medical library in seconds to perform surgery, that's peak mental enhancement. And the healing factor has been a bit inconsistent across the decades, but yeah, sometimes he heals from massive damage almost instantly. 
Other times, it takes concentrated sunlight. He's even come back from being nearly disintegrated by a nuke in one famous story. So looking at all this, it's clear his powers weren't set in stone. They changed a lot. What's the bigger story behind that constant evolution? Well, it, it really comes down to storytelling, doesn't it? Yeah. How do you keep a character interesting when he's that powerful? How do you create genuine stakes? The writers were constantly adjusting his power levels, adding new abilities, taking some away, introducing weaknesses, all to keep the stories compelling and find new challenges for him. Okay, let's trace that arc. Back in the Golden Age, the 30s and 40s, he was strong, but not ridiculously so, right? Mm -hmm. Lifting cars, trains, yeah. Super speed, faster than a train, maybe a blur. Leaping an eighth of a mile, which later became sort of guided flight. Durable, yeah, bullets bounced off, but like, Big artillery shells could hurt him. Had super senses, early x-ray vision, famously blocked by lead even then. Some mental stuff like photographic memory. But no kryptonite yet. Nope, no kryptonite initially. <laughs> there was apparently a story planned in 42 involving something called K-Metal, but it never got published. Kryptonite came later. Then you hit the silver and bronze ages, maybe the 40s up to the mid-80s. This is where his powers were absolutely nuts. True flight, faster than light travel, even time travel just by flying really, really fast. Immune to nukes. His senses became cosmic hearing whispers across galaxies, seeing atoms. This is also where the yellow sunrise sun thing really got cemented. And crucially, kryptonite arrived, the great equalizer or killer. They even introduced all those different colors, red kryptonite causing temporary weird effects, gold removing powers permanently. It got complicated. And then after Crisis on Infinite Earths in the mid 80s, the big reboot, they deliberately powered him down in the post-crisis era, didn't they? They did, yeah. John Byrne's reboot made a point of making him less godlike, more relatable, hopefully. No more moving planets. He couldn't fly faster than light. He actually needed an oxygen mask in space sometimes. His super senses were toned down. Mental powers were mostly cut, except the intelligence. And this is where tactile telekinesis really came in as that unifying theory for his strength in flight. as a conscious effort to make the physics, well, slightly less impossible. A course correction. Pretty much. Then, in the modern era, after Byrne left, his powers started creeping up again. Usually not back to Silver Age levels, but definitely stronger than the immediate post-crisis version. And that's when we got things like the Super Flare. And we see all these different takes in movies and TV, too. The old George Reeves show in the 50s had him doing weird one-off things like splitting in two or walking through walls when the plot needed it. The Christopher Reeve movies in the 70s and 80s, he famously flew around the Earth to turn back time, had hints of telekinesis, too. Smallville in the 2000s showed his powers developing gradually through his teens, gave him a really strong healing factor, maybe even mortality, his blood could heal others. And the recent DCEU films, starting with Man of Steel, showed him learning control, the visual shockwaves from his punches, heat vision hurting him to use. Right, and the DCEU also introduced the idea that the atmospheres of Krypton and Earth played a role, needing adaptation. He got progressively stronger, too, withstanding that gravity beam, shifting tectonic plates, eventually lifting whole apartment blocks. Each adaptation reflects its time. And through it all, the weaknesses remain key. Kryptonite and red suns are the big ones, obviously. But he's also consistently shown vulnerability to magic. That's a big one. High-frequency sounds sometimes bother him, even electricity in some animated versions. And his relative strength level, it really varies. He's often the benchmark. But characters like Captain Marvel, Shazam, Martian Manhunter, Doomsday, Darkseid, they're often shown as his equals, or even stronger. Plus, magic users like Spectre, Zatanna, speedsters like The Flash. And then there's Mr. Excise Pidalk, who's just on another level entirely and mostly just messes with him for fun. So wrapping this all up, what's the takeaway? We've traced Superman from this uh, strong man rooted in kind of shaky science what? to a solar-powered god, then dialed back for story reasons and constantly tweaked and reimagined across comics, TV, movies. I think it really highlights how storytelling, even superhero stories, is always trying to find ways to explain the impossible. Sometimes it borrows from real science, however loosely. Sometimes it just makes up its own rules. And the way his powers and weaknesses keep changing, it shows that need to keep the character engaging, maybe even relatable, as culture and science change around him. He has to evolve. It's been fascinating digging through these sources you brought. It really paints a picture of this incredible journey for such an iconic character. And it leaves us with a thought, doesn't it? Especially for you listening. With everything happening now in biotech, robotics, human augmentation, real world stuff, how might our actual growing understanding of what superhuman could mean, how might that shape the next Superman or the next generation of heroes? Could we see powers that feel less like pure fantasy and more like, well, plausible science fiction based on where we're heading. Something to only think about for the next deep dive.